Now we are going to enter into the second postulate, which is the linear momentum balance. Linear momentum balance. What is momentum? You know, mass times velocity. Linear momentum, why? Because it's just, there is another momentum, which is the angular momentum. Linear momentum is mass times velocity, okay? And balance, look that we are not referring now to uh, conservation. I'm not postulating that linear momentum is conserved. I'm just postulating that linear momentum is balanced. So that means that there is something in one side of the balance which is balanced by the other side. So I'm saying this is equal to this. Okay. And look, linear momentum balance is nothing that shouldn't be awkward for you. That's something that you know. In fact, is second Newton's law. Of course that Newton's, if you read to the Principia Mathematica, that was the way that Newton's, Newton uh, write the, the, the famous, uh, famous principle of, of, of mechanics, by the way, write, written in, in Latin. At that time, Latin was the universal uh, scientific language. And I mean, it's very difficult. It's it's it's, it's interesting to, to to read them because you don't find concepts that now we say that's Newton law. The the term force, the term acceleration, that doesn't exist. Then what New Newton said in the, the famous principles have been rephrased in modern mechanics. Okay, nothing has changed in the spirit, but the wording has changed pretty much. But in fact, Newton's second law is nothing else than balance of momentum. Why? Look, you know that Newton's second law is force equal mass times acceleration. So now imagine that you have a number of particles, just not to restrict to one particle, let's generalize the Newton's principle to a set of particles. So every particle has a mass, mass i, and every particle has a velocity and an acceleration, a i, v i, okay? And on every particle, there is a force, Fk. This force can be by interaction with other particles or made from the external. We, we, don't, we don't care about that. And what is that, that the second, uh, Newton's second law saying? It says that the resulting force on this set of particles, so the sum of all forces, okay, is equal to the sum of the masses of every particle times the acceleration. Of course, for per one particle, then saying that force is equal to mass times acceleration. But for the sum of particles, we can say the same. The sum of forces equal the sum of masses times acceleration. The sum of forces means for the resulting force. For instance, if there would be two interacting attraction forces between these two particles, they would cancel in that formula. And the only the external for resulting forces contributors would be the external forces, okay? But this is the second, nothing else than the second Newton's law, okay? By the way, the acceleration can be written as the material derivative of the velocity. That's something that we have already said. And then we can set this term as the derivative of the sum, okay, minus the sum, so derivative of that, what is the derivative of that? Would be the sum of the derivative of the first times the second plus the, the, the first times the derivative of the second. So we have to, in order to get this, we have to subtract of that the sum of the derivative of the mass with respect to t times vi. So it's just a way of expressing that as the difference of two terms. The derivative of the product minus the sum of the product of the, the, the derivative of that times bi. By the way, what happens with the term? The term is the derivative of the mass with respect to t. But can, what can we say of the derivative of the mass with respect to t? It's zero. Because we had previously postulated that mass is constant. So Newton was not so, <coughs> so explicit on that. Okay. But in fact, 
then just we can cancel that term. And what is this saying then? The, the Newton's law can be then, then interpreted saying that the resulting force of the system, one side of the balance, is equal to the material derivative of that. What is that? Why, by the way, that is the sum for all particles of the mass times the velocity. So that is the momentum. So the momentum that it's called, it's, it's denoted normally by this calligraphic P. So the second Newton's law can be rephrased. I insist that that was not the way that Newton postulated it explicitly, but in concept it is. That the resulting force on that system of particles is balanced, two sides of the balance, so equal to the variation with respect to time of the total momentum, linear momentum of the system. That's what second principle uh, Newton's law says. Okay? So it's a balance. And look, that's postulated. So if we postulate that, we obtain this. So it's the same postulating that the resulting force is equal to the rate of the mm, linear momentum than saying that the force force is equal mass time acceleration. One comes from the other. Okay? But now we just rephrase that sequence of the law in that way. And then we do not prove it. We just postulate it. We assume that this happens as building block, as a lack of our, uh, of our theory, the continuum mechanic theory. Look, what happens if the system is in equilibrium? Well, if the system is in equilibrium, by definition, the system in equilibrium doesn't mean that the forces at every point of the system are zero. It means that the resulting forces are zero. That's what the system in equilibrium means. And it doesn't mean that the, a system in equilibrium cannot move. A system in equilibrium can move. If there is no resulting force, I just can take this, ma this volume and say this. And during this travel, there is no force. Now there is a force. But during the, the jump, there is no force. Is the system in equilibrium? Yes. OK, well, there are forces. There are forces. I can say, what is the force that is acting during this traveling? Gravity. Gravity. But imagine that they do that in the moon, or in the moon, in, in the space. Okay? Then it wouldn't be any force. Okay? And then, in that case, in that case, what happens with this term here? The resulting forces are zero. So now we can say that derivative with respect to time of something that depends only on time, because this doesn't depend on point because it's the sum already, is zero. So the linear momentum is conserved. So this is a corollary of the linear momentum balance. In case of equilibrium system, the linear momentum is conserved, doesn't change. So the velocity of one particle can change in the other two. But the, the, the sum of them, in the case of equilibrium, has to remain constant. Okay, it's just a corollary. It's not that general. It's just a specification for a specific, a specific case. So that that in the terms we could call about conservation, because then the linear momentum in an equilibrated system conserves. It's conserved. Okay. In general, it's not. It's just equal to the resulting forces, external forces. Look, that is for a system of particles. But now, since our first approach to the continuum medium as a system of infinite far particles, we can apply the same. The only point is that instead of n particles, we have infinite particles. We have to sum for infinite particles. And instead of given masses, we have differential masses. But that's what we do. So we can compute the momentum of a system of a, 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 a continuum medium a material volume, material volume, as the integral of the differential of mass times the velocity. But differential in mass is the differential of volume times the density. So finally, the momentum of a continuum medium would be the sum, that is the integral, of rho, the density, times the velocity, times differential of V. OK? B, in principle, varying a long time because that, that Vt 
vary along time. time. But in a specific time, when the volume occupies a space volume V, then that is the expression of the momentum at this time. OK? So we can apply to this system of infinite particles the linear momentum balance principle and say, again, with no further ex expression, just postulate that what is happens for rigid bodies or what happens for system of particles also happens for continuum media. media uh, continuum media made of infinite particles which on top can deform. We postulate that. We extend the postulate, the second Newton's law, in terms of a, a balance principle to continuum media. And we say that the variation of the momentum expressed in that way, the derivative with respect t, which is, of course, the derivative with respect t of the integral of volume rho b, is equal to the external forces. By the way, what are the external forces in our continuum medium? Well, we already talked about that. In the, in, when I talk about the stresses, we start defining what would be the forces that we consider that were acting in our continuum medium, which were, first, the volume forces characterized by the specific forces, B. You know that B, in the more general case, is the gravity. is a vector, that's a vector, which has three components, 0, 0, minus G. Okay? And then, seeing if there are forces at the boundary, the integral of these forces times the, the, sub, the surface, subbed up through the boundary, that would be the resulting. Okay? So now we can say that we postulate that this, in one side of the balance, we place that term. At the other side, we place the term. And they equal to each other. That's our postulation. And let's see, and that's the, the, the amazing part of it, where are these driving to? Okay? By the way, as a corollary, we postulate, or well, it's, it's clear that if we postulate that, in the case that the resulting forces are zero, so if there is no body force and there is no uh, traction on the boundary, then we can say it again that the momentum, the linear momentum, remains constant. Okay? So that's our postulate. Now our work is just to develop that in terms of the knowledge or the basis that we have formulated before and see where does it, this takes to. So that's the expression, OK? We postulate that the resulting forces, the body forces, the surface forces, are equal to the material derivative, material derivative of the momentum, P, in that way, and we postulate that this happens not only for the continuum medium, but also for every part of the continuum medium, every subset, every subportion of this continuum medium. Okay, that's the postulate, and that's very important because without that, we couldn't arrive to where we want to go. So now a little elaboration. Look, when we talk about the stresses, we said that the tractions in the boundary can be written as n, the normal times sigma. So we just, this term here, this term here, then can be written as the integral of n times sigma, and we apply, we apply the divergence theorem. Because that is the integral on the boundary of a closed surface, okay, of something that multiplies n. And then the divergence theorem says that we can just transform this boundary integral into a volume integral by replacing n times nabla and keeping the same operator, in that case, the dot operator. So finally, we rephrase that part as integral of rho b times divergence of sigma, which is here. And we, so far, we keep constant the right-hand side. Okay? So we rewrite, rewrite that in, that in that form. And then, look, now we apply here something that we know, the uh, lemma, the Reynolds theory, uh, lemma. What is uh, Reynolds lemma say is that whenever I want to take the material derivative of an integral, if the kernel was rho times something, this can be computed as the integral of rho times the, the material derivative of something. So I take advantage of that. So just to take this derivative, I just put that into the side, into inside, and that's the way. Okay. And now 
we have integral of volume here and integral of volume here. And then which is that is postulated to be to be balanced, the balance to be true, by any subset of B and for any T. And then I localize. I take the delta B is differential of B. And then this term is the kernel times differential of B, and this term is the kernel rho dv dt or rho acceleration times dv. dv cancels, and we obtain that expression. That has to be fulfilled for any of the possibles dv. So I could take a dv at every point of the space x belonging to v. So it's for every x belonging to v and for any t. Look, this is a partial differential equation. Is that how many differential equations you see here? Look at any term. There's a vector. So that should be three, three, three components. That is the acceleration of the vector. And that's the divergence of the second order tensor, which is a vector. That's a vector. That is the local form. Local because this is the integral form of the linear moment of balance principle. But the one that interests us is that, which is a partial differential equation, which involves the differential with respect to space and differential with respect to time. So it's differential of equation with respect to space and time. Not easy, not easy to integrate if you want, but it's an equation, a partial differential equation, three partial differential equations, which have to be fulfilled for every space and every time. What is that? That is what we call the Cauchy's equation. You remember when we studied the stresses, at some point, at se I said, the stresses fulfilled that equation. And I said, this is a very important equation. That's a very important equation. And now I said to you, I cannot prove so far at this moment. I will prove that in the future. Now I've proved. What is that equation? The equation of the Cauchy's equation is the counterpart, the local counterpart of this, of force equal mass to acceleration. Look. Can we also identify part of force and part of mass and part of acceleration? Look, this is mass per mass per unit of volume, rho, times acceleration. So this can be interpreted as the mass of the differential of B, of a unit volume, times acceleration. So this is mass times acceleration. And here what we have? We have forces. You know? What is that? Part of the force. That's the volume forces. That is the force that acts on. A, dif a, a, a differential of B, draw B differential of B, okay? And then what should be then, at the, at, at the, in, in view of this, what should be this term, the emergence of sigma? What should be? How, how can it be interpreted? Pardon me? Guess something. Exactly. Is the counterpart, I mean, that, that's something that I cannot, just imagine, but now I see that if I want to establish the equilibrium of, sorry, go back. If I want to, to talk about the equilibrium of the differential of B, I have to place here force, force B, rho B, okay, at one side. And what about the forces at the boundary? Well, the counterpart, what corresponds from that at local moment is nothing else, no, nothing more than divergence of sigma. That is it. So the divergence of sigma now can be interpreted a posteriori as the counterpart at point level, at a special point level, of the body, the surface forces acting on the boundary. Okay? So you know that surface implicitly surface forces, external surface forces, are responsible for the stresses. And divergence of these stresses are what balance these forces to obtain the mass times acceleration, the second Newton's law. Interesting, right? If we were talking about, uh, well, th from the principle, from, from the beginning, we couldn't do that. We just, we have to arrive to that, to this very curious equation from a, a very general principle, the conservation uh, momentum, the balance of momentum, and finally, we arrive at that, and at the end, we interpret that as the counterpart at volume level, at point level, 
of the external forces. Is this force equal mass than acceleration? Look, what happens when we don't have any acceleration, when the, uh, the body is at rest, it's in equilibrium? Then the volume, or oh, the, the velocity is constant. The velocity is constant, that mean uh, long times, so that mean that this derivative is zero, and then we talk about equilibrium. We said that the body forces plus this, at every point, the counterpart of the surface forces are equal to zero. Okay, corollary. 